Um, we go on, otherwise we'll be too late to break for lunch. Who's presenting and for how long? I believe it's Jose, and according to the schedule, it's one hour, 15 minutes. 50 or 15? 15. 15. One, five. And that's it, right? And that's it. Yes. It's you? It's Giuseppe. It's Giuseppe, all right. I need to wait then. Okay, let's move fast to the new, uh, the next presentation, which is more about the same thing that we just saw, but now practical over the testbed that we have in the first floor of the CDTC. Uh, and let me start, I mean, Jose will do most of the presentation and the demo at the end, but let me just start with, with some considerations on the experimental work, let's say. Uh, and this is the abstract of the talk, if you want. Uh, this is what we want to do. This is the first floor of the CTTC building. <coughs> uh, what we have here is a set of femtocells that we want to deploy in the form of a mesh. So this for us is the, the old wireless network of femtocells. So you will have, uh, these are 3G femtocells though. 3G femtocells because at the time we wrote the proposal there were no LTE femtos. Even now it's well, I don't know of any LTE commercial femto that you might get, and, uh, and another additional problem of working uh, experimentally is that as a research center, you are not the, the regular customer for, for femto cell vendors, so it's really hard to uh, get one of those. So, um, so in the end, that's what we want to do. We want to build sort of a all wireless network of femto cells, this is the core network of the, of the 3G network in this case, which is emulated. We have this equipment in the lab. And it's not S1 interface, it's IUH, because it's 3G, right? the equivalent for femtocells. Right? Uh, well, this part there we are not using in MB femto because we concentrate on the, this is a, a node B, but we have in the lab, but, but we focus more on the femtocell side. And uh, the initial consideration I wanted to make, uh, to make is, is this, this lower part here, which is the experimental framework that we, that we have in the lab, which allows us to do, like, uh, minimize the time for experimentation or at least reduce it. And this is the goal of the, of the global framework. So we, we designed a framework that is the one that Jose is using afterwards to present uh, the results and to show you some figures. Uh, by the way, what you're seeing here is the grid here. This is, we assign coordinates so that it looks as a grid. And if you take a look down there, uh, this is the packet transmitted by, by each of the nodes. Uh, and depending on the code of color or the data queue length or the queue drops, so these are pre-recorded experiments that Jose ran over the testbed, and at the end you will have the same thing, but real uh, running over the testbed, right? So just didn't forget to mention that. <coughs> so uh, yeah, we wanted to minimize the time. Uh, we want to focus on conceptual reasoning, ideally. Like in a simulator, you put the you put the script there, and you run the experiment, and once you have the code, of course, of the thing that you want to test, uh, you may run many different uh, experiments with the same setup. Uh, so that's what we wanted, but for experimentation. And we also, once we had all the patches and drivers and everything put in the machine, we wanted to forget about the low-level details. So a user of the, of the environment just could focus on the conceptual reasoning. And this is how we attained it. We have a certain number of machines, all of them equal, so we spend one afternoon putting up the, all the 
uh, drivers, patchers, the appropriate hardware for the experiment and everything. We generate an operating system image for functionality, for example, an access point uh, with all the patches and everything. We get this operating system image that we configure, we put it in a server. So in this server we have a library of operating system images that then, through some configuration scripts, we distribute to all these machines at will. So we say, machine number one, take uh, work as an access point. Machine number three, also work as an access point. Machine number two, work as a, a emulator link. So, and we do that with all the operating sim system images that we configure just once uh, in one afternoon, and then we distribute them to all these machines. So in minutes, you can completely reconfigure the US scenario, let's say. And the same thing for the white topology. We have a certain number of cards in each of these machines that are connected to a switch. And we have uh, some scripts that, that automate the configuration uh, of this white topology. Right? And then we have this control uh, network through where we distribute operating system images. We synchronize machines for end-to-end -end delay uh, measurements. We uh, gather the results uh, once the experiment has finished. And we also tell each of these machines at each time instant what to do, like send these uh, traffic flow to a certain destination with this characteristic. So we, we try to focus on the conceptual reasoning. And the mesh part is also in this framework. So we can completely change the operating system images that we have in, each, in all of the nodes in minutes. Huh? And then we have also the cellular part of the, of the network. We, have, uh, we can have access to remote, uh, remotely to, to the nodes to see how they are booting and to see what's the problem, even if they don't have an IP address. Well, this is the generic framework. And we also have some commercial equipment, both for testing and uh, for putting like routers, commercial routers, in the middle of a, of a network setup. And this is the lab that we have in the second floor of this building. If you're, uh, yeah, this is the node B, this is the emulator, this is the rest of the 3G network, so uh, it acts as RNC, SGSN, GGSN, and it has part of the functionality of the HLR, so enough to say that we have a running 3G network here. And uh, these are the, the machines. This is the central switch with which we build the topology. The, the yellow ca cables are the control ones. And this is like regular networking equipment and network testing equipment. So going more for uh, specifically for the network of femtocells test, but as I said, we are building a grid. What you see here is the coordinates that Jose assigned to each of the nodes so that we have this grid over there. Uh, and in this, uh, we play with power, depending on the scenario, we play with power of, uh, transmission power of the nodes, attenuators, whatever, to, to in the end get a certain topology and certain uh, link uh, pattern, interconnection, let's say. So in the end, since we are testing routing in a multi-hop scenario, what we want is to have many paths between any two nodes in the network. So we play with these kinds of uh, topologies. And uh, this is a wireless home node B, not home node B, but home node B, it's 3G. Right? So uh, Session Com, and thanks to Thierry and Frederica and all that, provided us 12 femtocells like the one you see here. And what we did is globally, these two things, this, this is a small form factor PC where we have these marts of the routing protocol, and we connect this femtocell through an Ethernet cable to this uh, wireless mesh router, so uh, that all the traffic coming from this femtocell, commercial, we don't have access to internals of the code uh, of all that, so that's why we had to do this. We get all the, uh, let's say, commercial traffic, and then we, uh, in the end, it's IP packets for us. We put them in a geographic packet, and then we do the routing in each of the nodes. And this uh, small form factor PC, in this case, in, in the setups that you will see, we just have a, a single Wi-Fi interface, but they are prepared to, to have 
uh, more than one interface. In fact, in other EU projects, previous EU projects, we played with multi-radio nodes. And in the end, that's, that's what we have. So, so this is the commercial femtocell, no modification to any stack, and all the traffic coming from the femtocell will go to these uh, wireless mesh router, you could call it. And here is where the code that Jose developed is uh, put in place. So we take the decision. This is the, our geo sub layer, to tell you the truth. So globally, this is our wireless home node B. Right? So in the end, what we get is this. We, we have this setup where, for example, a UE attach, uh, I mean, with a regular uh, 3GPP defined interface to a commercial Femto. Uh, is routed multi-hop, sometimes packets from this UE will go this way, sometimes packets will may go this way, depending on the decisions, as you saw. In the end, they reach the local Femto gateway, and in the end, they reach the core network. So all these, uh, I mean, these, these uh, devices providing the, let's say, the home not be gateway side of the story, so the core part of the story, right? And this is what I just explained, the framework that we have. And now let's move on again to the details of how the routing is implemented on top of the testbed, right? Let's start with uh, with what we try to how do we uh, implement the, the routing protocol we just explained in into the 12 node uh, network of femto cells that we just deployed in the first floor of, the, of this building. Okay, so we implemented the 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 intelligence of the routing protocol in the in NS3. And we, but we, but we also want to to evaluate the routing protocol, not only in a network simulator, but in a testbed. What do we have to do? Do we have to implement from scratch the routing protocol in in another platform for evaluating the for evaluating it in a testbed? Well, uh, NS3 gives us an interesting future, which is the emulation mode, which basically allows you to send uh, simulated packets over real uh, devices and receive physical packets, real packets, sorry, to the NS3. Well, this is just a reminder of how the routing protocol we just explained works. I'm not going to enter in the details, so just recall that we have two components, the uh, minimization of the lap of drift and uh, the minimization of the penalty function weighted by this B parameter. And let's go to the implementation details. So basically, in NS3, the protocol has these building blocks. The network management in charge of sending hellos with queue backlog information and geographic information. The queue base, the, the data queue management, which just implements a FIFO data queue. And the intelligence of the routing protocol, which performs decisions on a per packet basis based on uh, Cuba clocks and geographic information. How does it work? Basically, we have the testbed, we have a node of the testbed, and we install an S3, the NS3 application in the node. So 
for uh, achieving that a packet generated in an S3 uh, is transmitted in the, over the testbed, we use a raw socket, which just in, is implemented in an independent thread of the NS3 application and just is in charge of receiving and sending packets. So that when a real package comes here, it's it's uh, received by the real device and forwarded to the raw socket, and then processed by the NS3 node. And also, when an NS3 node has to perform routing decisions and forward packets, the packet uh, enters this pipe and goes through through the through over the testbed. Uh, through the real device. Okay, so as we are on a Wi-Fi backhaul, uh, how do we get the packets into the NS3 node running on application on the application of the of the wireless home node B? Basically, we have two. Uh, filter the packet here by MAC destination address so that there are some packets that are going to be processed by the real uh, home NLB and other packets are going are gonna be directed to the NS3 application. We do that at the real car uh, exploiting the uh, MAC destination address, so that when the packet arrives to the real car, arrives to the real car, its MAC destination address is checked. If it matches a variable in the MAC Wi-Fi driver of the real device, it's processed uh, through the. It's processed to the NS3 node. It's sent to the NS3 node. Otherwise, it's uh, it's uh, going to the Linux stack. Basically, another issue that we that we have to deal with when we implement the the routing protocol on the on the testbed was the fact that we have two queues. One uh, located on the hardware and one located on the application. How do we deal with that? We need the, the total queue length of the of the node in order to take routing decisions. <coughs> what we did is to register the hardware queue length on a RAM on RAM file on the RAM file subsystem, which is uh, a file subsystem which is quick and fast to be accessed by the NS3 application, and so. We can get, uh, thanks to this file, the hardware queue length. This hardware queue length is sent to the NS3 application, and so we can get here the uh, total queue length of the of the node. Another thing we have to deal with was the scheduling between the application queue, the, the queue located at the application layer, and the queue located at the kernel level. Because if the hardware queue gets full, the application queue must be somehow stopped. So we have to deal with some kind of scheduling between the two queues. How do we deal with that? What we did here is to use netlink sockets so that a message whenever the hardware queue length is full, is sent th uh, from the kernel level to the NS3 application layer, indicating, OK, do not send me more, more packets to the hardware queue. Once the hardware, the hardware queue gets uh, empty, another message is sent from the kernel level to the NS3 application, indicating that the NS3 application can start sending packets to the kernel. 
So this is basically, uh, these are the two interactions we have between the, the kernel le space and the user space. One from reading the hardware queue length through the sys file sy subsystem, and one for uh, sending this asynchronous message between the kernel space and the user space in order to schedule the, the two queues. Okay, with regards to the routing setup in order to evaluate the routing protocol, we have to configure two kinds of routing because of the way uh, femto cells are connected to the to the to the to this equipment, which is a wireless mesh router. So at the end, in practice, what we have in order to some ca somehow emulate this wireless home and not be, is to uh, set up route, uh, back pressure, distributed back pressure routing for dealing with the Wi-Fi links and setting up a, a static route to, set, to, to deal with uh, the link of the Ethernet between the femtocell and the Wi-Fi mesh router. So that whenever a packet is directed to the, to the UE connected to this femtocell, uh, the Ethernet is used, and whenever the packet is not for a, a UE directed connected, to, attached to this femtocell, but distributed back pressure routing is used for the Wi-Fi backhole. The network of femtocells is deployed on a very uh, a small space, and we want to, to evaluate uh, multi-hop topologies, because we, are, we have to evaluate the routing protocol. So uh, we have to force somehow uh, multi-hop topologies. How do we do that? What we did is to, since the, the, the layer 3 topology is defined by hello broadcast messages, which are usually sent at 6 megabits, what we did uh, is to increase the hello uh, broadcast rate at which these messages are sent. So that the range between uh, be the, the coverage between, the, between the, the, the range that the hello broadcast messages can achieve is minimized. In fact, we do this by uh, patching the mat wi Wi-Fi driver so that we can select uh, whatever rate we want to evaluate. Okay, so since we have now with uh, sending uh, hello broadcast messages at 54 megabits, uh, layer 3 multi-hop topologies, now we can uh, set up the methodology of the experiments uh, for the evaluation in, a, in, a, in the testbed. So these are the, all the data set of the, of the experiments to evaluate the routing protocol. And let's start with some reference scenarios that we tested uh, to uh, validate the implementation of the routing protocol. We make a single, uh, a very simple setup on a single hop topology, and we compare uh, the results with those attained by NS3, so that this this graph uh, represents the the throughput that we can attain at one single hop with two home and bees connected. And uh, as we can see here, the throughput attained by the testbed is quite similar to those at, to, to, to the one attained by the NS3 simulator. So we can say at this point that uh, the emulation mode is able to forward packets without incurring into performance degradation.
these are uh, some uh, statistical experiments that, uh, well, these are some results that show the statistical uh, variance that we can get uh, at different software loads. We can see the high variability that we can obtain in the in the testbed. And these are some results that we get to, uh, when we configure uh, two hops. When we configure two hops, we start to get some uh, significant difference between the testbed, which has uh, a quite a significant variance, and the simulator, which is quite more uh, ideal than the, than the real thing. But this variability is uh, caused by the multipath environment in which we are, uh, since we are evaluating the routing protocol in an indoor office, we have uh, significant multipath uh, problems and so propagation errors, which are the cause of this variability obtained uh, at different, at different, with different replications of the same experiment. Here uh, we can see the, uh, from a given offered load the variance of the of the good put attained at two hops of the destination with several trials of the same experiment. We can see how the the, the variance that we can get is is quite high, no? Right. Okay, so now that we have validated the implementation, at least for very uh, reference scenarios, we wanted to evaluate the state of the Wi-Fi links, also using uh, NS3 emulation. And we carried out different experiments during working hours and during uh, night, using Hello Broadcast Messages as proving packets for evaluating the Wi-Fi link packet delivery ratio. So that we can calibrate the testbed and we can have an idea when we evaluate the routing protocol in uh, generic setups. We can see here that for every link, the variability experience during the day and during the night is quite different. Precisely during the night, we experience quite low variability uh, in the same link that during the day. During the day, uh, given that we have mobile uh, obstacles, variability of Wi-Fi links is quite, quite more high. So. Uh, going to the evaluation of the routing protocol with several flows, we performed an experiment in which six flows, two, four, and six flows were injected to this node here. For uh, different, uh, we injected uh, two, four, and six flows, and each flow injected one megabit, the parameter V was set up to 100. We still haven't evaluated the variable V algorithm in the testbed. It's uh, future, future work to do. And we performed this experiment 15 times. For every number of, uh, for every, every offered load injected to the network. Moreover, we wanted to evaluate the impact of the Wi-Fi wi -Fi link rate configuration on this experiment. And we use a uh, sample rate uh, algorithm in order to uh, have an idea of which uh, Wi-Fi link rate should be the more appropriate. In this graph, uh, 
we saw the choices taken by the sample rate auto, uh, auto rate algorithm for the Wi-Fi links. And we plot the, dis the distribution of uh, the packet delivery ratio of the, of the data packets uh, given the choices of the sample rate algorithm. And we can see how it seems that the 36 megabits was the more used choice for by the sample rate algorithm. And uh, this one, one of the choices that we take afterwards in order to evaluate the routing algorithm using a uh, fixed Wi-Fi link rate configuration. We choose this and we choose also this in order to to get if the to, to have an idea if this algorithm was able to to get an appropriate estimation of which was the the appropriate link rate configuration and results show that uh, on the one hand results show that on the case of two and four flows injected into the network of femtos the rate uh, the, the the achieved good was not was not different for the different uh, rate configurations, but on the case of fixed flows, we seems we, we, we get an we, we, we get an, up, an upper bound on, on this testbed setup. And as we can see here, the one that better uh, behaves was the the one uh, offered by the 56 megabits configuration. Sample rate shows more variability, given the given that the behavior of this algorithm is to try to to go on a, on a higher on a higher uh, rate if no no losses are 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 experienced and the 54 megabits was the one that uh, get got the the worst uh, results Other key aspects that we wanted to evaluate was the degree of load balancing of the routing protocol. We, we performed different experiments with different B parameters. But we go to the, to the extreme cases. We have here the extreme case in which uh, there are no, no routing decisions taken by the penalty function, B is equal to zero. Decisions are just taken by uh, taken by the using Q backlog information. We injected a flow from this node to this node. This node has just two networks. And over time, we plotted the number of packets forwarded by every network, for, forwarded to every, every of the intended network here. We got that no matter the, the, the distance to the destination, both networks share approximately the, the same number of packets. We repeat the same experiments, but, we, we, but increasing the B parameter. And we, what we found here is that the closer network get, got all the packets, and the farther network do not get any packet. Well, this. Uh, serves to, 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 to validate that the load balancing part of the routing protocol was also working. And now, uh, if uh, nothing has happened in the first floor, we will try to, to do a live demo of w what we are already showing here. These are just offline experiments that we carried out uh, several weeks ago. And now we are going to try to to do a leaf demo. So the first experiment that we want to show, I will explain here, is OK, let's try to send a flow of uh, 2 megabits from this node to this node using a high degree of direction in reaching the destination. So 
let's give very a high emphasis to the penalty function. Let's close this and let's execute. Okay, let's pray now. Okay, as we should see, like that the routing protocol is okay, it's working. <laughs> that's good, that's a relief. <laughs> it's sending packets, this node, we are painting the number of data packets transmitted by every circle here, which represents a home node B. And they are getting to this node. Here, what is happening in this node is that it's seeing two networks available because just in terms of uh, as, uh, coordinate assignment, it's behaving as a grid. And so uh, Wi-Fi links cannot follow, may not follow a grid, depending on the, no, of the variable, variable environmental conditions. And as we can see here, as these two nodes are approaching, are closer to the destination than this node, here we can see uh, how the traffic is being distributed. Here, traffic is not being distributed because here there is a brick wall. And usually this, this Wi-Fi link is not, is not working. Configuration is a single radio, single channel for all the nodes here. Okay, the experiment has just finished. And now let's try to repeat the same experiment, but decreasing the B parameter so that uh, all the network can be used. We do this by decrementing the B parameter to zero. So in principle, we should see here that all the nodes, if Wi-Fi links are in a good state, uh, have be, are being used. Let's pray another time. Okay, the experiment just started. And here we have how those nodes that uh, have now stable Wi-Fi links are being used. It seems that this node now is not working very well. This node is working. The traffic is directed to this node, which is not, tra not transmitting packets. It's, unidirection it's an u unidirectional flow. <laughs> now this link is working. <laughs> Note that the, the number of transmitted packets at every time, uh, at every uh, time slot by every node may be different due to the contention issues of the, of, of the CSMA CA medium because now we are on the <laughs> real now we are dealing with the real thing and now uh, let's try to execute uh, a multi-flow experiment. Now we are trying to send to this node six flows with a high degree of direction. B is uh, configured to 200, which means given the hardware queue length of the node, that means basically practically null load balancing in the network. And these are the nodes that are chosen for sending, sending traffic to, to this node. started. We should see that just these nodes, okay, just these nodes are being used.
null load balancing, this means that these nodes in principle shouldn't be used, this set of nodes here. <coughs> also note that there is a tendency to have uh, uh, the color of the of the of the nodes tend to be darker uh, near the, the destination that farther of the destination. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better to use a fixed uh, uh, density scale in order to um, to have a better mapping on the on the darkness of its color? Uh, because I, I see that on the right hand of uh, the screen the scale changes the number of packets I suppose it, w it would be better to be fixed in mm. order to know the correspondence of uh, yeah, the number of packets and know whether the dark corresponds to uh, 500 packets let's say each time to and not to change on a per second basis perhaps mm -hmm. it would be better uh, uh, visually talking a percentage of packets or something like that yes or a, a fixed number yeah. perhaps yeah. because number. from second to second this changes and you mm. not do not know whether the black color uh, is uh, blacker than the previous yeah th <laughs> the thing is that yeah, I, I, I got your point yeah but if you change, a yeah, a, a percentage will be. But uh, the, the 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 problem I think is that if you change the offered load, uh, the scale should change yes. also. So yes. it's you like, can do, you can do some more experiments yeah, 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 yeah. You're you're right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, and so let's go back to the conclusions of this talk. Okay, we, we have uh, given some hints on the implementation of the routing protocol, also given uh, some results of the, on the evaluation of the routing protocol, and one of the main conclusions is that uh, if you want to get simulation and experimental results, I would go with NS3 because you don't have to re-implement twice the, th the thing, at least if, if you want to test functionality. For proof of concept, I would go with NS3. It will, you will invest less time implementing. Okay. So that's all, with this I conclude. Okay, thank you. So what's next? <laughs> what is coming now? Well, now uh, I'm obsessed with this V parameter. All right. <laughs> and pretty obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> now the, the thing is that, the, as you know, the, the last phase of the Vifemto project is about exhaustive evaluation. So first year was about concepts, second year about mechanisms, and these uh, up to June, we are like uh, testing exhaustively what we designed and uh, for sure we will have more ideas like maybe testing different cost functions or uh, yeah, preparing the demo for the final audit also. Right. Yeah, yeah, this this is part of it in fact. <laughs> this was an initial <laughs> demo, no? Show some initial things. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, it's always like it's like with cooking, you know, you spend a lot of time preparing the food and you eat it in five minutes. So it's a bit like here, you spend a lot of time, years and years, and then it's, you know, ten minutes showing uh, a colored graph. So yeah. it's it's difficult, yes, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, so the experimental research for I think, I mean, the testbed setup section is a small percentage of the paper. But in the end, it's the, like, 70 or 80 percent of the time of the paper, let's say. Okay. There are more questions? Yeah. I was wondering, mm, yeah. was it really difficult the interaction between NS3 simulator and I mean to use the f functionality of emulation for emulation? 
because I think this is a very I interesting yeah, and depends. many people want to know and also ask me by the way because I, I'm working with Anna Spray yeah. and many people tell me ah I know that functionality of emulation was it hard did it cost a lot for you I mean the, the coordination between the two schedulers the kernel yeah. queue and application queue and Anna Spray it basically depends on the particularities of the network protocol if it's a network protocol uh, that you want to test. In this case, mm -hmm. as I, I have to use uh, cube clock information, I, I have to, to, to do this scheduler because all the functionalities that I need to do the routing decisions were implemented at the routing layer, mm -hmm. not at the MAC layer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But, it but if you want to implement to port to the, to the testbed OL, OLSR, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't have this problem. Yeah. This problem was caused by the particularities of the of the back pressure. Uh -huh. you, you need this information to get routing decisions, but for instance, uh, OLSR doesn't have this problem, so you don't have to this extra work. And the the the, the intelligence of the routing protocol, I didn't have to change a single line of code. That that's important. Yeah. Changes were just on the data plane, mm -hmm. not on the control plane. Well, uh, on the inter on the the, on, on the next hop uh, building block, you know, on the yeah. on the on the building block that has to compute the routing decisions. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to change a single line of code. Okay, thank you. All right, excellent. Any other question? If not. Thank you very much, Jose. All right, so I think we're coming to the, uh, to the very end, uh, Friday afternoon, and uh, I think we had a pretty productive, uh, inspiring week, uh, maybe uh, bead only because we have been taken away from our emails and uh, usual working routine, just have a bit of time getting inspired whilst listening to presentations, thoughts, uh, new ways of presenting, doing things. We have been going through the business case, and that was pretty important just to show, you know, it's not only R&D driven, but it's also market driven. What we're doing here has a real impact in the end on, on engineering solutions, on customers, on businesses, large uh, or small. We moved on then to some physical layer challenges, loads of challenges there highlighted, propagation issues, planning issues, radio resource management interference uh, issues, and we went on to the optimizing that all self-organizing stuff. Today we had networking issues. So I think we have a pretty good picture. It is clearly very far from complete, but uh, I think it gives uh, you who have come as attendees um, enough building blocks now to know where to look up information, uh, to know whom to email, to ask, to call, and uh, you know, just get uh, essentially the R&D going in the area of m 2 cells. So without uh, further ado, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for talking. Goodbye.